Okay, I want to welcome you back and I am I am in a moment going to move us up to a more collective level to think some together about what might be going on for us even you know as a species and how it may relate to adult development or the evolution of consciousness but before I move up to such a lofty level and inspired by at least by the way that you kind of got us started I want to I want to begin kind of by just speaking more personally and kind of, you know, as Lisa would put it, kind of noticing myself, noticing my own uh, reactions, not exactly right in this moment, but when my, my dear colleagues asked Lisa and I, you know, if we would be up for doing a webinar at this moment, you know, on relationships between adult development and the current crisis, I want to confess to you, that my immediate response was, I don't want to do this. Um, I can't do this. And the reason I felt that way is because um, I, I felt then, which was, I don't know, a week ago or whatever, uh, just as I feel now, and just as many of you may feel in any given day in the midst of this, I feel, you know, fine or okay-ish but at the next moment I might feel over, overwhelmed by, you know, by worry or I feel demotivated or I feel, you know, too disengaged. Um, I feel distracted. I feel unsettled. I feel in our language subject to the crisis uh, that it has me more than my having it. And my, my natural stance is why would anyone ever want to come and speak to anybody in such a state, right? So this is, you know, this is my preference, which is to, you know, feel like I'm in control. I love the illusion <laughs> that I'm in control. And uh, the, so there it is. There's, there's the feeling that comes up for me. I don't feel in complete control. I don't feel I've got it all together. I don't feel I'm on top of this situation. So, you know, how could I possibly like come and talk to you and, and say anything? And so once I'm aware that I have that feeling, then I can be in relationship to that feeling. And while I remain subject to the, to the crisis, perhaps I'm not so subject to that reaction. And so it's also kind of a way of saying to you that I am going to invite you in now to a, a set of, of thoughts about kind of our current situation and, and kind of the, you know, adult development or the evolution of consciousness. But I'm not, I'm not sitting in front of you here like I have it all together or like I am in control or like I am on top of all this. I'm talking to you in spite of the fact that I am just as unsettled as any of us might be by what all is going on. Lisa has also said to me uh, instructively that I'm not good at asking for help, which is absolutely true. So if I'm going to talk to you in a state of actually not being as settled as I would normally like to be, uh, maybe I need to do it, I want to do it in the spirit of asking for your help because I'm gonna ask you to see if you can kind of stay with me for like another 15, 20 minutes or whatever uh, on top of a lot of very rich material that you've already been listening to. And I'm going to just kind of take, take support in kind of feeling you with me as I kind of share these thoughts. And I invite you also to maybe keep your pen in your hand and not, again, to be taking any notes about what I'm saying, but to be taking any notes that you might want to, taking any notes that you might want to uh, as to what is coming up for you as you're listening to me because I think um, if we manage our time well, you'll still have this chance for a second breakout. It's possible also, I'll just alert you, that you know we're living in a whole new world. It's not like you've all got to run to a meeting somewhere out of your house. But if, you, you know, if we run a little bit over the 90 minutes, I hope that'll be okay. Those of you who will have to leave us, of course, will leave us. So let me now kind of launch into some of these thoughts and start kind of um, at the highest level, which is to say, without any intention to diminish in any way 
the horrors of what we've even just begun to experience and the ways in which things inevitably are going to get worse before they get better. That at the same time, trying to hold on to multiple realities, at the same time that all that is true, that we are living in the midst of pain and we are going to be living in the midst of even greater pain and more of us are going to start to know more people you know, who are positive and so on, that in the midst of all of that, it is also possible to consider that there are some big transformative potentials in what is happening. Big transformative potentials that, that many, much of which might not be realized for years and years from now, and some of it you know, has the potential to be uh, realized even in the shorter term. So I want to first just quickly name three elements of what I think is going on right now that I don't hear kind of identified enough uh, or that we're not giving credit to, to these features that are also, that we're also living with that I think create transformative potential. The first of these three features, these are all obvious to you, but it's just, I think, worth naming them, is that one of the things that is so remarkable, so unprecedented about our current situation is that you have something like the entire species all focusing in a concentrated way, in an urgent way, on the same thing. We live, you know, in the opening decades here of the 21st century in the most distractible age probably in human history. We have so many things that, you know, ordinarily distract us. It is incredibly hard to get any group of people to attend to something. Look what is happening right now. More than 7 billion people on the planet are all focusing on the same thing urgently and not for one day not for one week, but for months. I, I can't remember the yogic master who said attention is love. Attention, concentrated attention with a kind of urgent focus creates an enormous kind of energy that we are all a part of, that we are all contributing to, that we are all experiencing. And I'm just saying this is a potential. I'm not saying it must lead to some great advance for the species, but I'm saying it has the potential to because something is happening that has, I've lived for 73 years. Nothing in 73 years has ever equaled the level of collective attention that we're now experiencing. The second thing I want to point out is that, you know, many people have said uh, it feels almost like you're living in a movie, like we're living in some apocalyptic movie. And I, I totally understand that. But I think it's also important that we get it right which movie we're in. This is not the movie of how we live after a nuclear war. This is not the movie of how we live after a bioterrorist event, even though it can feel that way. The species has taken a blow to the gut but this is not a blow that we have delivered to each other. We would be in a much different situation. We would be in a divisive kind of situation as a species if what we were suffering through right now was the result of human beings attacking other human beings. And so this is, this is the movie of the giant asteroid coming toward Earth where we are all drawn together uh, to face, you know, this common kind of threat. And this is something to be grateful for, and it's something to also recognize that we're in a moment not only of all this concentrated attention, but in a way that is potentially very unifying, because we are not, it is not leading us to hate or fear our fellow man or woman. It's not leading us to consider how we're going to retaliate. It's not leading us to, to contemplating starting some kind of war against each other. And that is an extraordinary feature of what's going on. And the third thing that I think creates all this transformative potential is that this is a shock to the system. This is like a jolt to the system. This is a discontinuous kind of event. And those sorts of experiences that shake us out 
of our current uh, state or situation, again, have transformative potential. Remember, both words are important. I say that these things have potential. These potentials may never be realized, but I want to just invite us to consider that there is the other side of potential, and that is that they could be realized uh, in some way. So it's in that context that I want us to consider a little bit the ways in which our current situation might actually be a contributor to the, the, the species-wide human story of our own kind of evolution, in particular, obviously, the evolution of human consciousness. And as Lisa said, all, all evolution of consciousness, as we understand it, whether we're talking about a small child moving from a fantasy-oriented view of the world to a more concrete view of the world, or an adult moving, as Lisa was talking about, from the more socialized, made up by the surround kind of view of the world, or moving into a more self-authoring view, or whether we're talking about the species as a whole, any of these transformations always involve, at some level, moving what was subject to a place where it is object, where we can now reflect on it, where we can now look at what before we were looking through. And now when you take this to a species-wide level or a collective level, just as a very quick example, uh, and by the way, I should just tell you that everything I'm sharing with you, are these are just my thoughts. I don't know that any of these connections I'm making are true, okay? I mean, these are just the thoughts that I'm sharing with you, okay? But uh, they're not, I'm not the only one who's thought some of these things. So as a quick example, I wanted to just suggest that some people have suggested that the birth of the modern environmental movement came in the 1960s when we, when satellites were, were for the first time able to send back to us pictures of the whole earth. Those of you who are older may even remember the whole earth catalog. And the, the, the cover of that catalog was that picture. For the first time, human beings were able to take the earth itself as object, rather than just being kind of embedded, you know, in the earth as creatures of the earth, we were able psychologically to be out there in space and look at that little fragile planet that we live on. And that this arguably enabled a shift, both in cognition, a kind of recognition, a recognition of our relationship to the world that also then opened up our hearts in a way to begin to care for care for the state of that whole planet and its environment in a way that we weren't earlier able to do. So notice how this is a subject object shift. It's a shift of mind and heart. It leads to a new kind of recognition, a new recognition that opens our heart and enables a bigger capacity to care, to care for that which you can see. Because when you're subject to it, you can't see it. When you can see it, you can begin to care for it. You can begin to have a kind of responsibility for it. Okay, so I promise I'm not gonna take you through a whole social history of the evolution of human consciousness uh, since I only have another moment. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna take you through a whole human history of, of, of the evolution of consciousness, but I do, before I turn to our present moment, uh, if you can just stay with me, I actually want you to take a minute or two and join me several hundred years back uh, in our past to the, the Middle Ages. Uh, also, you know, referred to as the Dark Ages. And if you kind of had to say, what was it that led us out of the Dark Ages? What was it that led us into a, a new kind of light? It was, uh, I believe, uh, the beginning of a shift in consciousness, which then got reflected into a shift in social organization. Because in the, in the Middle Ages, the social organizations were largely one in which you had a very small number of high-born aristocratic noble men and women, and you had a huge number of peasants or serfs. And, uh, you know, this was, this was the uh, the way the world was organized. And some people believe that 
the seeds that led to the evolution of the middle class, one of the great social transformations in the evolution of the species for all kinds of reasons. I'm not gonna have the time to go into right now, but the, the development of the middle class has led to all kinds of advances for, for human well-being and for human evolution. <clears throat> and the seeds the seeds of what ultimately led to the evolution of the middle class, according to many kind of intellectual historians, I think are also where we find the seeds of the movement from the socialized mind into the self-authoring mind. If you, have, if you ask me, when do I think in human history that the self-authoring mind began to appear, you know, in any kind of large numbers within the species, I would say that it, that it, was, that it followed the dark ages and was part of what led us out of the dark ages. Now, there is, a, there is a, an argument to be made that the seeds of what ultimately led to this transformation took place during what was, has variously been referred to as the Great Plague, the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague of the 1300s. Something of enormous transformative potential occurred during the bubonic plague in which the, the great mass of people, the peasant class, the serfs, whatever you want to call them, they, throughout that plague, which went on for many years, they saw something, they experienced something, they felt something that was profoundly disruptive for them. And what they saw was that the highborn noble class died just as easily as they did. That it was not just their children and their spouses who succumbed to the plague. So did people with beautiful clothing who traveled in carriages and had noble titles. They died just as easily as, as the poorer person did. And this experience broke a spell. It ended a kind of magic notion of a higher class's divine right to its privilege. I'm sure back even in the 1300s, there was some free thinker running around sort of saying, is it right that if you're born a peasant, you're always going to be a peasant for the rest of your life? And I'm equally sure that the response that free thinker got was, you know, some version of, uh, dude, this is reality. Uh, this is, you know, the, the world that God created. Why is the sky over your head and the ground at your feet? Because this is God's design. This is the third order. This is the socialized mind. The notion that what is given to us whether it's the emotions that show up inside us that Lisa was referring to, or whether it's the world as it is currently organized, for the socialized mind, that world is not just organized that way. That, that's, the world is as it is supposed to be. There was a notion of a divine right. The poor person called these wealthy people, my Lord, that there was a divine right to the wealthy class having their privileges and the, the plague arguably broke that whole thing open, dis disrupted it, disturbed it. And there's an argument to be made that, the, that, the, that in successive years, not, not two weeks later, okay? Not decades, it might be, I mean, it might be many, many decades. If you wanna look at kind of the evolution of the Magna Carta from which even the American constitution draws and so on, the ideas of individual human rights. I know I'm talking very fast because we only have so much time. All of that, you know, may have, may have come out of this. Okay, so now let's move forward quickly, you know, some, uh, I don't know, six, six, seven hundred years forward to our own situation and our, you know, our own uh, plague that we are kind of living in. And it's true that each of us individually in our own individual evolution, we have the opportunity and the possibility to undergo the same evolution that started to break on the scene back in the Middle Ages, where you break open that spell and each of us, you know, ontogenetically experiences something of that when we go through our own 
uh, transformation. I don't know why my video keeps uh, going off. But we're also, we're also in a position, so we're in a position where each of us individually can make this move to the self-authoring world. But we're in a very different position, you know, than the Middle Ages. We have a, a critical mass of, uh, of people who construct the world uh, in a, in a self-authoring way. Today, if you kind of think about what is the leading edge of evolution for the, the human species, uh, today, the leading edge has to do with the possibility of transcending the limits of the self-authoring mind, transcending, you know, kind of the fourth order. And the hallmark of self-authorship which leads to all kinds of wonderful things which we've already been referring to, but like every developmental place has its own limitation. The hallmark of the, of the self-authoring mind is the creation of systems, the creation of institutions. You know, whether these are legal systems or the status systems that create the sovereignty of separate nations or the healthcare system or the, the global economic system. And these systems have all kinds of merits that I don't have the time and don't want to go into right now. But it is also true that these systems, these systems permit rather than correct or constrain some of the biggest problems that we face as a species. These systems permit rather than constrain the ways we are poisoning our environment. These systems permit rather than correct the increasing forms of economic inequality that we all live with. These systems have enormous limitations and they are actually not able, they are not able to solve the many plagues that plagued us before we ever heard of COVID-19. We were a sick world before the virus and the systems which we have created, which have, as I said, in many ways have been an enormous advance to human evolution, those systems are clearly not able to solve those kinds of current problems. Now, in the midst of all that, consider what the crisis might be doing for that kind of system level of thinking. The virus has no respect for these boundaries, has no respect for national distinctions. It spreads, it, it clearly shows us, you know, if someone sneezes in China, it can infect me in Minneapolis, that we are, you know, literally connected. The, the, the way in which the peasant class over many years experienced viscerally to their bones the absolute uh, spell that they were broken from of a divine right to privilege, it, there's a possibility that for us to experience the ways we are even now talking for the you know, very first time we're talking about the species as a whole, how many people are we and kind of what, what all is, is going on, creates uh, a certain kind of extraordinary potential. The, the potential again to see that these these systems are, are actually mere constructions. Again, that a new spell is possibly, uh, there's a seed here for the possibility of breaking a new kind of spell as we come to recognize that yes, we are members of particular systems in particular countries and so on, but it is showing us the virus it has the potential to show us even more deeply as each week, you know, uh, is, is lived. That we're not first of all Americans or, or Chinese or first of all rich or poor or first of all winners or losers in a global economy. We are first of all members of one single vulnerable species just trying to make its way on one single fragile planet. We are first of all members of one single vulnerable species trying to make its way on one single fragile planet. And the more that we come to experience that, the bigger is the transformative 
potential. That these systems, valuable though they may be, are mere constructions. They are contrivances. They are useful only as means or tools or as objects. When we are subject to these systems, they're terribly limited because of their inability to actually respond to the biggest problems we face and that we faced before the virus even came to us. What if the virus might ultimately help more and more of us to wake up from the givenness of our current systemic arrangements and lead to a new kind of recognition, a new kind of recognition, a new kind of responsibility, a new kind of caring. Greta Thunberg, the young environmental activist, has said that she doesn't just want her parents' generation to be concerned, quote unquote, about the environment. She says she wants to see grown-ups panic she wants to see them panic effectively, where out of their panic, they will collectively come together and act as if their lives and their children's lives depend on what they do. What if what we are now experiencing in this present moment is Greta's wish come true, where more and more adults are panicked and response, trying to respond in the most responsible way as if their lives and the lives of hundreds of thousands of their, of their fellow citizens, millions of their fellow species members are kind of at risk. Not kind of, but are at risk. So I'm coming to the end of this long set of thoughts and I wanna end just with a few questions give you a minute to sort of think about them and then invite you into one more breakout to give a chance to talk with each other a bit then we'll come back and then we'll conclude i don't know that i even need to ask you these questions because i'm hoping that you know you're, you're having your own responses to what i've been saying but the questions you know are there really some form of what could each of us individually or collectively, what could we do to put ourselves in a position where we are more likely to realize these transformative potentials that I've been inviting you to consider? How might we act so as to further nurture or nourish these possibilities for a bigger kind of recognition, a bigger kind of recognition that could permit a bigger sense of responsibility. And how do we increase the chances that when we get through this crisis, we do not just rush back to reinstate the world as it was, a world which, however much at this moment we might long for it, was itself filled with its own plagues, its own spells, its own toxins, its own injuries to our fellow members of the one vulnerable species of which we are all a part. So let me then invite us into kind of a minute of quiet, where again, you have a chance to make whatever notes you might want to. And then you'll be gently whisked back into the very same groups that you were in before, I believe. That's my hope. And you'll have, again, let's give you the same 15 minutes. You know, we're going a bit over the 90 minutes. Again, if you don't want to stick with us, of course, you can leave, but hopefully you'll stay with us. And uh, let's give you that minute of quiet, then you'll go to the small groups, then we'll come back and we'll briefly conclude. So take a minute for yourselves. <laughs> 